And we're back with more of the Pope on film. Okay, but we 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 got to go back and look at the chap screen anyway. It's a good chap screen. I feel like the HBO logo is going to pop out of it. Is this the sh the half screen? Okay, there we are. There we go. Look at that. It is wonderful. It is wonderful. I thought you were talking about the thing that was playing before then, which looks like the... Ooh, look at that. Okay, so a globe, half historical approximations. It looks very good. Yes. It looks very good. I like that. Thank you. No problem. It needs okay. an update. Yeah. So are we ready, Bunny? So now we're back with more of the Pope on film. It's time, buddy. It is time. It is time. Yes, buddy, my friend, it is time once again for all of us here at the Pope on film podcast to go loca right into our second half of the show. And it is said second half wherein we finally and eventually get around to discussing our all-new hand-picked and now available without a prescription movie of the week and this week we continue our celebration of the life and films of legendary film director pedro almodovar by watching the 1954 giant ant movie then aka Ants on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown. That was the original yes. title. Not a lot of people know that. Now, Bunny. And if for the those army was only more sensitive to the needs of the ants. Yes. You know. I would like to see a version of, of uh, this movie from the ants' point of view. Yeah. You know? From their point of view, it's the humans that are the aggressors. Mm -hmm. So, Bunny, they for those didn't people ask who to get that big, exactly, they did not ask for this. They didn't land on Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock got big on them. That's right, or something like that. Okay, so two things. Number one, it is harder than I thought to eat a Starburst while podcasting. <laughs> Um, that's what I'm learning about right now because I'm a professional. And secondly, I wanted to ask you, Bunny, if there are people out there who might be joining us for the first time, would you like to explain why we are celebrating Pedro Almodovar by watching a 1954 American giant bug movie that is in no way related to him? Because I went and I downloaded a nice selection of films that we are still trying our best to try to honor, um, but I was not able to get a dub and or subtitle version of any of them. So, there we go. I was stuck. Giant monsters. Yeah, I'm absolutely okay with this. 100%. Ah, now, of course, you wouldn't be able to to watch Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown in Spanish, but since I am a proud Latina, I know a lot of Spanish. Let me tell you my all, all the Spanish that I know. Hola! Soy Dora! Have you seen Boots? That's all I know in Spanish. But it's good. If I'm ever in Mexico and I'm looking for boots, I'll be able to know what to say. So that's good. Um, this is true. And you never know what yeah. comes up in life. But before we get into the giant bugs and the giant and giant grasshoppers, who would believe such nonsense? The old ones were spookier. They, they had castles and full moons. Yeah. They were meaty. <laughs> they had a poetry to them. And you know what else? The women. So, 
let's talk about the man in question, Mr. Pedro Almodovar. See, I consider myself a big-time film historian, and so I, I know so much about movies, about films and film directors, and so I thought that I could do a quick bio of Pedro Almodovar, which should be pretty easy for me with no mistakes, wink noise. So let me tell you about Pedro Almodovar. He is an American movie producer and director. He's best known as the director of the Elvis Presley 1968 comeback special, as well as the notorious 1978 two-hour TV special the Star Wars Holiday Special. The man who directed the Elvis Presley 1968 comeback uh, special yes. also directed the Star Wars Holiday Special. And that man's name was Pedro Alm... Oh, wait. Okay, that was actually a bio of American filmmaker Steve Binder. <laughs> And not Pedro Almodovar. Apparently, he's uh, Mexican. So, uh, now we don't have time. Oh, no. Now we don't have time for me to do the bio. Don't worry, Bunny. Next week, I'm sure to get it right. This is true. Well, Bunny, what can be said about the movie, then, that hasn't been said a million times before about other giant monster movies? That little girl was fucking awesome. She, she was, was good. That she is was good. The best performance in a any movie of this type. <laughs> she finally snaps out of it. They're they're uh, putting a small bottle of formic acid in front of her, and she smells it, and she snaps out of her hysterics, and she says, "Them." What I would have liked is for her to snap out of it and then gone. And, and that's the title of the movie. In yeah. the, the them fuck, just F-U-C-K. Fuck. You know, whatever she would have said first, that would have been the title of the movie. Why and do... My dogs... Why do hmm? old scientists... Always have hot young female assistants. Uh, you know who the old scientist was? I'm pretty sure it's the same one from the last fucking movie. It was Chris Kringle! 10,000 letters, all addressed to Santa Claus. That was fucking him. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah I looked it up. Oh, okay. On the... Uh, I looked it up on, how do you pronounce it? Imdaba. I looked it up on the Imdaba. According to the Imdaba, the old man who starred in this, who played Dr. Harold Medford, was also Chris Kringle in fucking Miracle on 34th Street. I find that fascinating. Nice. And uh, here's the big story that I found about this she movie. She was right. She had, she had mentioned that. She had kind of thought so. I didn't quite yeah. get she, what she meant, though. Yeah. I will say this about this movie. The director is incredible. In frickin' incredible. The director's name is Gordon Douglas. He started doing our gang comedies in the 30s. Then in the 40s, he directed all of the great Gildersleeve movies. Okay. And one Dick Tracy movie, like Dick Tracy versus Cue Ball or something like that. And then later, and then he did this, he did them. And then after that, he did uh, a number of movies, including the Elvis Presley comedy Follow That Dream, uh, Slaughter's Big Ripoff, okay. and the no doubt racist Bob Hope comedy Call Me Bawana. I haven't oh, seen it, but with a name like Call Me Boana, 
with a name like Smuckers, it, it has to be racist. Yeah. And then, in 1977, he did his last film, Viva Knievel! Nice! That's a, that's a crazy-ass uh, filmography there. Yeah. You know? Our gang, Gildersleeve, Dick Tracy, them, Bob Hope being racist, a kick ass black exploitation film, and Viva Knievel. That's, that's quite a resume. So, hands, kudos to the man who directed this. My wife yes. said I've got my headlights off. Yeah. Um, we might have to black bar this whole discussion of the movie that M. So, <laughs> Uh, Walt Disney saw this movie before anybody else. Okay. Because Walt Disney was like, oh, I'm finally working on my dream project. Telling people the story of Davy Crockett. Oh, but who will I get to star in the Davy Crockett series? So he was interested in casting whoever the fuck the guy was who played the FBI agent. Hi, I'm uh, FBI Special Agent Sexual Harassment. <laughs> oh, look, a chick scientist. Hey, baby. You know that guy? Yeah. Hey, he, Disney was like, I think he's going to be a great uh, Davy Crockett. Let me watch this movie. But uh, Walt Disney was obsessed with um, uh, the... The, the actor who had a small part in the film as a, like, a pilot in the mental ward. Yeah. And that was Fess Parker. Yeah. So this movie led to Fess Parker getting the starring role as Davy Crockett. All because of this one part in this one movie that Walt Disney happened to be screening. Uh... At his, I don't know, uh, stately Wayne Manor. I hate the luckily noise. They had, luckily, they had a backup guy in a mental institution who also saw giant ants. Who mm -hmm. later went on to become the old man in the blob. Yes. Yes. I like, um, I like, uh, the fact that Fess Parker was in this because um, everyone knows the uh, uh, the theme song to Davy Crockett in Me in Spanish in Mexico. It, the theme song to the Davy Crockett TV show is slightly different, though. In Mexico, the theme song goes like this: Davy. Davy Crockett, we killed him at the Alamo, and that's how the song goes. Yeah. It's a, it's a bit more of a festive song. Yeah. I kind of like it. I fucking hate the noise that the ants make in this fucking Yeah. It triggers my fight or flight response. And I absolutely hate it. It just that oh, it drives me fucking insane. And I didn't fully realize that until just now. <laughs> I hate that sound. Watching this movie again. but Well, then it's a good thing that you never see more than two ants at a time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's freaking hilarious. <laughs> That's freaking hilarious. I love this movie. This is a good giant bug movie. Yes. I like it. If I had to choose between them and the giant Gila monster, I'd choose them. Yeah. If I had to watch uh, them or... Peter Graves and the Crickets, or or what was his name in the Crickets? If I had to watch the Crickets, I would watch them. If I had to watch them or Food of the Gods, I'd fucking watch Food of the Gods, because that movie's a fucking mess. 
Marjo and fighting I, a giant chicken. Yeah. It yeah. is not to be beaten. A giant rubber chicken. Yeah. I, I would pick that in a freaking heartbeat. But this is a this is a fun movie. It's fun. And Why? plus it's Warner Brothers, so it's got some money to it. Like it's not Yeah. It's not one hundred percent cheap. It's like sixty percent cheap. Yes. And I appreciate that. Why were the ants so obsessed with sugar? Ants eat um, everything. Why were the ants so obsessed with sugar? Oh, because the Archies just scored a number one hit at the mm. time. Okay. And so everybody was, was uh, at first, Constant they were like, fight. oh, hey, we're giant ants. Let's go get some honey. And then it's like, oh, shit, there's giant bees. Then, then what? What else comes in the song? Oh, honey, do 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 do. Oh, sugar, sugar, sugar. We're gonna get a shit ton of sugar. And that's how it was chosen. The Archies were very big. Everybody was riding dune buggies in the desert with tires filled with water and just going. I think it would be so much more entertaining if giant ants just wiped out of. Heard of a farmer's cows? Yeah. You know what I'd like to see? I'd like to see... You know how, like, the blob came out? And then, like, in the 80s, there was that grisly, violent remake that people like. Yeah. Why stop there? Kevin I'd love Hunt. to see a gritty, violent, bloody as fuck version of them by the guy who made Terrifier. Yeah. Hell yeah! Ah, but I shouldn't wish for that because they did do that with a bucket of blood and we know how that goes. Yes. As Shadow Stevens appears. Yes. We don't want to summon a wild Shadow Stevens to show up. <laughs> Shadow Stevens. And who so, was that? Uh, Michael C. Paul? Huh? Who was it that played the, uh... Oh, man, I am blanking out all the, the Dick Miller part. Was that the Anthony nerd Michael from Hall? 16 Candles. Yeah. Yes, Anthony oh, Michael Hall. There you go. I, I was thinking the nerd from 16 Candles or the guy who dies in the second in uh, Halloween Returns. Okay. <laughs> but I told it, I could have just done failed 80s SNL and it would have come to me like right yeah. off the of bat. Yeah. But I like this movie. It's it's fine. It's yeah. fine. So I saw the greatest double feature of all time, Bunny. I saw Saw Patrol. Yeah. It, it was wonderful. It was gorier than I thought. It was uh, pretty violent. It was really violent and really bloody. And there was a lot of heart to it. Oh, and also Saw was good. Yeah. You see what I did there, Bunny? Yeah. I thought that was funny. I saw Paw Patrol in an empty theater, and it's just, I'm, I'm just a high as fuck trans mother of five in an empty theater watching Paw Patrol. I, <laughs> it was great to watch Paw Patrol in an empty theater because I was just cussing the shit out. Yeah. And it's like, Paw Patrol, roll out. And I'm like, fuck you, you're not my dad. <laughs> so that was, so that was fun to be able to do that. Saw was pretty good. It took a while to get going. Yeah. Like the like there's one death trap that's really uh good and it's got like a this guy and his eyes and there's tubes and um and it appears like 10 minutes into the movie, but then it's just a it's just John Kramer daydreaming. The first real death trap doesn't appear until like 45 minutes into the film. 
Really? Yeah, it takes a while to get going. And then when it does, it really gets going, and it's really good. But it, it, it took a while to get going. And, 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 and I'm just going to come out and say it. I have been regularly listening to the song Down Like That from the Paw Patrol movie. Okay. It's like it's like a it's like a cool rap song for kids. And it's like the theme to the new Paw Patrol film. And before the movie there was a music video for it where you're supposed to dance like all of the individual Paw Patrol members and I'm like, this fucking sucks. But sure as shit as I'm driving home, I'm still hearing this stupid ass song in my head and it just burrowed into my brain like a worm and so now I've become obsessed with a song from the Paw Patrol movie <laughs> so I gotta say the Paw Patrol movie I think has stuck with me more than Saw X did and also there's no way John Kramer and Amanda look way too old for this to be set between Saw and Saw 2 it's just a fact. It's just a fact. It was a good, good movie, but that's that's fine. <laughs> uh, what else? Oh, something else I wanted to mention. Um, being a trans woman, I experience so many things that other people don't get to. Good and bad. Both sides of the spectrum. For example, yes, when I'm in public and I need to use a public restroom, I am putting my own life on the line. That's a negative. But on the positive side, um, I had an ex-girlfriend, not really a girlfriend, we only went out like once or twice, contact me upset because my boobs are bigger than hers. Okay. That filled me with a joy that I cannot fully explain. <laughs> but it, it was fucking wonderful. Ah. Oh. And the, the clouds parted. They did. It was amazing. It was amazing. These puppies... Yes. I don't have anything else. I've, I've, <laughs> I've been making most of this up. I'm pretty high right now. Good. How are you, Bunny? Good. Uh, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. I'm kind of high as well. Sweet. Not, not edible high, just casual smoking high. I, I am always edible high. Yeah. And it's... Because it, I can't smoke that much. I've got the asthma and whatever. Um, I can't smoke weed because um, I'm left hand. Yeah. That's just how it is. Um, I'm a big weed person. I'm a weed aficionado. I, I'm, I'm a weedist. Yes. As we all call ourselves. Uh, 420, wink, wink. <laughs> That's a code. You you people probably don't know what I'm talking about the because lingo. I'm a weedist, as we all call ourselves. Um, do you have anything, Bunny? Um, just that if we were ever actually attacked by giant ants, we would never have a fucking chance. I mean, this comes down to the killed two ants and flamed a bunch of eggs. Apparently, back in World War II, troops were issued flamethrowers? I thought that was just some fucking bullshit that they made up for the 14th fists of McCluskey. <laughs> but, so, but soldiers in World War II were given flamethrowers, and so the people in this movie that were using the flamethrowers were all veterans who had worked 
flamethrowers before. Nice. So if anything, um, Jake Cahill wasn't in World War II. No. Because he doesn't know how to work a flamethrower. Unless a hippie is, is trying to <laughs> kill you in your pool while you're trying to listen to uh, Snoopy and the Red Baron. Can, can we do something about the heat? <laughs> It's a flamethrower. I, <laughs> I love that movie so much. Let's talk about that and not them. I love the fucking soundtrack to Once Upon a Time dot 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 in Hollywood. No, I love the AM radio bits that they play. Yeah. That uh, 93 KHJ, the AM radio station, has a massive backlog of actual recordings, full recordings, including commercials, of their radio station throughout the 60s and 70s. They have a web, uh, a YouTube channel where they will just play uninterrupted and with all the commercials, hey, here's three hours of um, uh, morning drive time programming from our AM radio station on January 17th, 1967. Nice. And so what's fascinating about the soundtrack to Once Upon a Time, dot, dot, dot in Hollywood is that whenever you hear an AM radio station, that is literally what was playing on the radio exactly when this uh, the scene was playing out. Yeah, and I, I love that so much, so fucking much. <laughs> so, and so that's why Pedro Almodovar is an incredible director. Yes, he is. Hats off to I, Pedro. I hope that our lengthy conversation about the Star Wars Holiday Special, Viva Knievel. <laughs> Davy Crockett and trans breasts has really given you a profound understanding of the importance of Spanish filmmaker Pedro Almodóvar. Yes, so that's we why have, we're doing we all have of it. Try to make it as clear as we can, uh, but but we we also don't want to overdo it. You know, we don't yeah. want to just be shoving Pedro Almodóvar down your throats. Yeah, we don't want to be scaring people. Yeah, we don't no. want to be scaring people. <laughs> Say no, it, buddy. Say it. That's not what we're about. Yeah, that's not what we're about. Hey, is there a warning? Ten minute warning. Thank you. I just wanted to hear it from you. <laughs> um, hold on. Let me get a pen. So that's it for this week. Uh, next week. We're, we're celebrating Buntober. I don't think I mentioned that. We're celebrating Buntober because it's uh, Bunny's birthday month. It was his birthday uh, two days ago? A yeah. few days ago. He turned 25. He can rent a car now. This is true. So uh, during Buntober, Bunny takes over. That rhymed. I'm a poet, and I didn't even know that I could rhyme things. <laughs> so uh, Bunny has taken over and this year we are celebrating the life of Pedro Almodovar the legendary Spanish film director by watching American giant monster movies from the 1950s did yes. I get that right Bunny? that is it that is correct we. so next week what will we be watching? Well, unfortunately, we will not be watching 2006's Volver starring the lovely Penelope Cruz. We will not. A woman whose mouth is so big, she might as well be Canadian. Her mouth is so big that she can eat an entire gerbil like she's on the V spaceship. Yes. Unhinge your jaw. 
And then you see the big thing just... <laughs> Trailer hitches quake in fear. <laughs> but we will not be covering that movie, unfortunately. I have it. Yeah. It's in Spanish. Okay. Instead, we will be doing 1953's It Came From Outer Space. It came from outer space. Uh, outer space is what I call my dick. Okay. My lady penis, I call it outer space. So this title takes a different tone in that way. Why is my pen all dirty? Anyway, I'm high. So yes, next week we will be celebrating Pedro Almodovar and his uh, wonderful film, Volver. And we will be celebrating it by watching It Came on the Face of Outer Space. Yes. Uh, Naked it came in the mouth of outer space. It's called snowballing. Yes. Uh, it is so weird the music that we play at the Halloween store because some of it's Halloween music, uh, but some of it is not. Like I'll be listening and and they'll play uh you know Mamma Mia. They'll play uh Don't Stop Believing. They played a. Uh, Black Sheep by the Clash of Demon Head? Yeah. And, and then they played... Uh, oh my god, I don't, I don't remember what I was, what I was going to say. They, they played Godzilla a lot by Blue Oyster Cult. I would like Blue Oyster Cult to follow that up with uh, Gamera. Yeah. I think Gamera, he is pretty neat. Gamera, he is made of meat. We believe in Gamera. Like, get two cowbells this time. Yeah. I, I would, I would like to see that. Uh, so it came from out. Oh, so that's what I was saying. I just remembered snowballing. They played Chewbacca from Clerks. Yeah. Yeah. Chewbacca. That was real. What a Wookiee. Yeah, they were playing that just in the Halloween store, and I'm looking around the Halloween store, and all I'm, all I'm seeing are fucking white parents who just came from their kids' soccer game. And we're, we're just playing Chewbacca from the, from the Clerk soundtrack. And then after that, they played uh, Primus and the Chocolate Factory. Yeah. Yeah, they played a Veruca Salt song, I Want It Now. <laughs> and it's like, they're just playing Clerks followed by Primus, and everyone's fine with that. Yeah. One Night in Bangkok plays. None of you know that this is a song from a musical about competitive chess written by the people with penises from ABBA. <laughs> None of you know this. This song is playing. None of you know who the Clash at Demon Head are. This is Envy Adams singing. I get really serious about the music that plays at the Halloween store. <laughs> you probably couldn't tell because I hide it so well. You do. But I do because I'm so good at a hiding thing. Hiding emotion. So, next week is going to be an exciting one. It came from outer space. It came while looking at outer space. But now that I look back at this episode, the highs and the lows, uh, Madagascar, we're beating Canadians at being polite. So, fuck you, On Canada. On airplanes. On airplanes, On yeah. airplanes. Uh, I'm no longer a virgin, but he can rent a car. <laughs> the guy who directed the Elvis Presley 1968 comeback special also directed the Star Wars holiday special, which I think more people should be talking about. There's a 
There's an Elvis to Life Day pipeline. Yes. That no one is talking about. <laughs> Elvis could have teamed up with Itchy and Lumpy and Jefferson Starship. It's Elvis Presley and his uh, doing a duet with the Arthur in the cantina. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> Just blew your mind. Now that I'm thinking back at the entirety of this episode, Viva Can Evil, shit, I think this has been a pretty good episode. This okay. has been a damn, damn good episode. Okay, good. I felt the same way, but I feel like you're the person who makes the distinction as to whether or not it's a damn good episode. But yes, I concur with your assessment, good sir. So until next week, I am Bunny Williams. And I am Reverend Malin, and on behalf of Natasha and uh, Mal slash Q, who is not here, and all of my kids, I just want to say thanks for listening, and we will see you next week, you godless heathens. <laughs> And you do draw fucking booby tits. And. And. Yes, Eleanor? And. I'm covering up because, again. And you doggies? Oh, okay. That's pretty good. Okay. Help me uh, play play the, the podcast out. You just spilled all of my water. Oh, my God. Ah! Ah! <laughs> ah! Hi, Bunny. Hi. Oh, crap. Ah! Can you still... Buddy! Yes. Uh, hold on. Okay. Uh, shit. Okay. Can there you see you me? Go. Okay. We're going on a road trip. Okay. Do-do-do-do-do-do. <laughs> Cut and print. And, and get a towel. Cut and print and get a towel for all of the water that you just built. And cut, cut and print.